What's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen. Get some. It'd be funny to me when I'm on the road, man. Like when I travel, like uh, like if I'm at an airport or I'm at a, uh, you know, if I'm at a mall or something, it's weird. It's like nine times out of ten, if I get stopped for an autograph or a picture, it's usually by black people. Every now and then, white person will stop me. Doesn't happen a lot, but it's usually by black people, you know. And I know why. It's because most stuff I've been on on TV and movies has been black stuff, you know. But most of the movies have been on black lead actors, TV show. I was on a TV show for a little bit called The House of Pain, and uh, this is a black show. If you guys ever watched it, it was on Wednesdays from 7 p.m. to 5 in the morning. It was every Wednesday, a little, little 10 hours they gave Tyler, you know. I always tell people, man, that's why stand up and entertainment, you never know when shit could happen, man. Because I'll tell you what, how I got on House of Pain? Random. I just ran into Tyler Perry. Accident. I'm at a radio station doing an interview. I leave the radio station. Tyler Perry came walking in. I never seen him, never met the man. I just said, hey, Tyler Perry. Just kind of waved, you know. Tyler Perry looked back. He goes, hey, what's up? And then we just start talking about life. Nothing big, you know. Five minutes in a conversation, Tyler's like, hey, Gary, man, I kind of like your vibe. kind of like your outlook on things. Um, think you won't be on House of Pain? I said, uh, let me check my schedule. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And people ask me that all the time, man. They'd be like, hey, man, Gary, what's Tyler Perry like in real life? What's he really like? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I ain't say nothing on set. I went to my dressing room. I shot my scene. I went back to my dressing room. I ain't say nothing. I wasn't fucking up that check. I ain't say shit on set. <laughs> Whatever Tyler said, I just agreed. Tyler's like, I'm hungry. I could eat myself, yes. You know? <laughs> I'm cold. It's a little chilly outside, isn't it? You know? I remember my first day on set, my first day on set, I came on season five, right? Cast is already established. I'm the only white guy in the whole cast. I get there, I'm a little nervous my first day. Um, we don't even do anything the first day. You know what we did? We went and voted. Everybody went and voted for the president. We got in vans, we all voted together. Kind of a cool thing to do, but I, what I remember was, they don't know me, I don't know them. I just remember when it was my turn to go into the voting booth, I look back and the whole cast is looking at me like, motherfucker, you know who to vote for, right? <laughs> I got it. I'm on the squad now. I know exactly who I'm voting for. Just became very clear to me. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. Uh, you can listen to this on iTunes. Uh, search Gary Owen or search um, hashtag Get Some or search United We Cast. Or go to YouTube.com backslash Gary Owen.com and listen up. Uh, I am currently in chicago illinois and it is fucking freezing sorry to start the podcast like that but it's so cold here when you walk outside the first thing you say is fuck <laughs> like I, somebody told me it's been the coldest two days here now this is i'm recording this on december 29th so i've been here the 28th and 29th at the horseshoe casino in hammond indiana which I want to thank everybody for coming out because we sold out two shows. It was myself, Bruce Bruce, Lavelle Crawford, Damon Williams, and Teddy Carpenter. Two great shows. Packed house, big theater. I love that venue. But I decided to stay in Chicago because um, I didn't want to stay in Hammond, Indiana. And yesterday, I was walking around, and I literally could feel my lungs getting cold. I've never felt anything like that before in my life. Like I was breathing in like, yo, I can feel my insides getting cold. There should be no cryo centers, cryo machines in Chicago in the winter. All you do is walk outside for 15 minutes. You're good. I don't know how they have gangs here because I would be a seasonal gangbanger. <laughs> I'm joining a gang and they're like, yo, you, we got to jump you in or you got you to gotta shoot this person. I'll be like, can we wait till March? <laughs> Oh my God. And then I'd be up, if I was in Chicago and got shot, I'd be upset. I said, damn, bro, you gonna shoot me in the winter? Now my blood is frozen. Maybe that's good. It'll coagulate on its own. It would just, you would just bleed and it would freeze. Like you'd be, you'd have your own tourniquet. It's so cold that literally that's all you say when you walk outside is fuck. You hear a pasture curse. It's so cold out here. Fuck, forgive me, Jesus. <laughs> Cause I've, I've been to Chicago in the winter and I know that wind comes off the lake. And it's not a game, but all my life, it's never been this cold. And I hate to make it a race thing. We're, we're freezing yesterday. We was walking around. I had to return some items at some stores here. And we literally saw a white dude with shorts. And me and my road manager, Brad, went, what the, what was that? We got scarf, a scully, gloves, a hood. We're still freezing. This guy had shorts on. There's a video of two, maybe two years ago, three years ago, where some city had frozen over. And the news team 
spotted these this man and woman, white man, white woman, jogging in the middle of this snowstorm. I caught up with Chelsea and Michael who were jogging by and were nice to just stop for a quick second. And I said, what are you doing running? And you're saying it was really good out? It's the perfect texture for running. Very low impact on its dry snow so your feet don't get wet. Oh, what have you seen while you've been out running? It's been a lot of fun. There's a lot of other runners and more skiers than runners for sure. I think they've got a little bit of the advantage with yeah. the whole stride and glide thing. But it's too nice to not be out here. Yeah, it's incredible though just to see even people still on their bicycles. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how they do it with the bikes. Like That's braking, at least we we can control, you know, at worst case, we can just slide right through a stop sign and we'll be okay because we're pretty visible at night. Did this surprise you, the snow? Um, this much of it, I think. When we woke up this morning, we were definitely surprised by how much there was. We were sort of joking, but it was a nice dusting. But the reality is, is this is a... This is a real chunk of snow, giving Hood a run for its money. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we're both California kids, so we haven't had many snow days in our lives, so this is pretty exciting. All right, well, go ahead and keep on the run. I'm sorry to have kept you, but I appreciate you guys talking thanks. with us. Stay warm. All right, thanks. So we've seen a lot of people out here, like you said, running, sledding, just enjoying it. One thing, oops, that can happen, unfortunately. No, no, it's the perfect texture to run. It's very soft on your knees, and it's so beautiful. Bam! Head hit the head hit the snow, the ice in the middle of the road, laid out, and then she gets up and like waves, like it's okay. But you can tell she's like hurting, but she's trying to save face. All my life, I laughed so hard, but it wasn't just that she fell; it's the way she talked, because it was it was subtle. She was very monotone and very so confident. No, no, it's the perfect texture for running. That's the one thing I remember. It's the perfect texture for running. Very low impact on its dry snow so your feet don't get wet. <laughs> Bam! She was out. And then the way she tried to save face by just, she had to hold her like, it was holding her butt in the back of her hamstring. I was like, oh my God. And then here's the thing. I go to Detroit tomorrow. It's going to be cold there. And then on New Year's Eve, I'm in Dallas at the Verizon Theater, but it's going to be freezing there. I got to call my agent and be like, yo, man, did I piss somebody off at the agency? Why are you putting me in the coldest damn cities back to back? <laughs> right now, 40 degrees would seem like 80 to me. It's so cold. Woo! I can't wait to get out the cold, man. I'm not going to be out of the cold anytime soon because once I leave Dallas, which is going to be cold <coughs> on New Year's Eve, then I go back to Cincy and I'm off to the 11th. So I'm just, and then I go to Baltimore, the 11th to the 14th. I'm, I'm going to be in this weather for a minute. I just got to make sure I keep a scarf, throw lozenges, gloves, all that stuff. Um, all right. Well, I hope everybody has a great new year, a better 2018 than 17. But Christmas for me was, um, I mean, it was cool. It was, uh, it's funny when you were an adult and you, you have a joint bank account, uh, every gift I got, I bought. And I'm sure my wife feels the same way. Every gift she got, you know, she kind of bought. I mean, <laughs> you know. So I, I got my wife, she wanted this coat. It was an expensive coat, but she really wanted it. I was able to get it. I got her a, um, a new case for her laptop. I got her a scarf that she really wanted. And what else I got? I got that, that. I got her the jacket, some, some other little knickknacks. I don't know. But this year, you know, sometimes we'll be like, we're going to take trips. But I told her this year, I said, I want to open some gifts this year. I want to get some gifts. So I got gloves. I got a scully. Got a couple new pairs of shoes. Uh, I can't remember what else I got. Sweats. Basic stuff. But, you know, I, I don't care how old you get. It's still cool to, to unwrap gifts. It really is. But the older you get, you kind of get become like a gift expert. Like, I knew there were shoes in the box. Like, <laughs> I don't know why you're a little kid. Like, you, you should know what's in the box. But, like, I knew the way it was shaped. I go, that's a pair of shoes. And then I felt, I go, this is some gloves. I can kind of feel and figure out what's what. It's rare when you stump me on a gift. My son got some Yeezys. I don't know how much those are, but he got the real ones. He was so ecstatic with them Yeezys. And then I tried them on. I was like, they, they ain't super comfortable because me and my son got the same foot. I mean, I'm 12. He's 12 and a half. But I tried on his Yeezys and I was just like, all right, they cool. But I, my my personal shoe choice is Pegasus from Nike, the running shoe. Because I'm at airports and I'm walking all the time. So I always tell my wife or anybody, if you don't want to get me a pair of shoes, you don't want to break the bank, I said, just get a pair of Pegasus. I, I got so many colors of them and I wear them out so much because I'm 
you know, I can wear them to the airport, then I can wear them to the gym, and I ain't got to pack a lot. But I, from my feet, the Pegasus from Nike is the best running shoe and walking shoe, just to walk around. And they got so many cool designs and colors. I realize I'm getting a little too old for Jordans. And it's there's nothing worse when you when I go on the road, and I got I got my road manager, I got Gene, the guy that opens up for me, and then I got Say, who's my web guy, but he also opens up for me. I hate it when I go in the green room and we all got Jordans on, it, <laughs> like a walking Footlocker right now. So I just I'm not gonna wear Jordans when I'm with those guys because I'm like, come on, man. And it'll, it'll be different colors. Say will have like the blue and black. Gene will have like black and red. So now I have like a green and black. I mean, it just, it's just all different colors, but I'm like, somebody's going to call us out one day. I remember one time when I was doing stand-up, and this is back when jerseys were big. Everyone was wearing football jerseys, probably, what, 15 years ago, 16 years ago? I showed up, and me and the, uh, my opener both had Eddie George Titan jerseys on. And not the real ones, the, the, you know, the replicas. And I just like, hey, man, I hate to pull weight, but you got to take it off. <laughs> so luckily he had a t-shirt on underneath it but he's looking at me like no way like i, didn't, I never worked the guy before he worked with me we had been together for a couple of days and i'm not even like a tennessee titans fan i just like the blue i had like stuff to go with the blue jersey i was i remember i was in el paso texas like 2003 i think and uh i was at this club from wednesday to sunday wednesday thursday friday saturday sunday so that's what five days yeah when i tell you my opener Wore the same shirt every night. Same shirt. It was a some kind of soccer jersey. But I mean, by the by Saturday, I was like, I was asking like guys, I go, is he wearing the same shit? Or does he have like a couple jerseys of the it's the same jersey? And it was like, no, it's the same shirt. I was like, that shirt was wearing itself by Saturday. I hate, I hate to like like judge the guy because I'm like, yo, uh, you know, openers aren't making a lot of money at all. So he probably just needed to work. What's crazy is the only reason I was working El Paso that weekend is because I was moving from L.A. to Cincinnati at the time. So this was 2003. And the good thing about a stand-up was I was driving, was driving the car back um, across country, and I picked up work on the drive. So we're moving back, and I was able to stop for four or five days, uh, do this show at the comedy club, broke up the drive a little bit, made some money, and then drove home, you know? And actually, El Paso is funny because that was my first ever road gig back in 1997. First time I ever went on the road and did stand up. I and I, it was funny. I was still in the military, and I got to open. I opened for this guy named Chaz Elsner. I'll never forget as long as I live. And I drove from San Diego to El Paso. One like boom, left in the morning and just drove it in an S10 pickup stick shift. I think I got paid five hundred dollars for the weekend. The whole weekend. So we probably did six or seven shows. We must have did, yeah, five or six shows. I think I got $100 a show. So I thought I was rich. I thought I was loaded. And we we stayed in a um, we stayed in a three-bedroom, like, I wouldn't even call it a condo. It was like an apartment. Me, Chaz, and the host. And there was an Arby's across the street. And I think I ate Arby's every day. Because I would eat at the comedy club. And I eat at Arby's. And I really want to eat much in between because I was thinking I don't have a lot of money just to be spending on food like that. So it is funny in, when you're a stand-up and you, you, your, your palate changes, but your food changes tremendously. When you first start, most guys are probably in their 20s and you're just like, you eat whatever. But you also are conscious of how much money you're spending on food. Like you might only eat twice a day because you're like, I got to save up. You know, I can't be, I can't be going to a steakhouse every night. Cause I remember thinking <clears throat> one time I heard, um, I went to the Pittsburgh improv and the manager goes, you know, DL Hughley has a steakhouse that he really likes in Pittsburgh. And he would go there and eat every Friday or Saturday when he was in town. And I remember thinking, can't wait to get to that point. I can't wait to get to the point where I can just go out to eat wherever I want. And I don't have to worry about it whether the meal's $10 or a hundred doesn't really matter. I know I got it. I think that to me, like making a decent amount of money as a standup when people like, you know, as your life change, I go, oh, I think I'm still the same person, but my so-called splurges and the things that I appreciate the most are things like that. 
that I can just go out to eat wherever I want and I don't have to look at the prices on the menu or worry about it because I can do it. Now, I still get petty when I'm out to eat with my boys and nine times out of 10, I'm picking up the check and I feel like they're, they're abusing the treat of this meal because I always say, order like you're paying for it because we still laugh today at my road manager, Brad, because this dude, let me tell you what he does. I'm in Atlanta and this is probably 2009, 2010. And I'm in my hotel and I'm content hanging out in my hotel. Brad called me and was like, yeah, you want to go get some breakfast? I was like, that's cool. He goes, I'll pick you up. So he picks me up. We go to this place called Thumbs Up in Atlanta. Great restaurant, great breakfast spot. And I'll never forget, I got just an omelet, basic omelet, I don't, no extra size and like that. And I had water to drink. So my bill, my portion of the bill was $8. That's it. Brad got an omelet with extra salmon and he got a side of fried fish and he got orange juice and he got some refills on the orange juice. For some reason, orange juice refills are free. I don't know why orange juice is the champagne of breakfast, but you order orange juice and it's always funny. Orange juice has its own cup game going. You order a small orange juice, it's like a shot glass. Now you order a large, that thing's in a tumbler. <laughs> Drastic difference in most places between a small and lower, large orange juice. But I'll never forget, our bill was over $40. And I looked at Brad and I was like, okay, my bill was eight. Your bill was over 30, 32. So then I said, I told Brad, I was like, hey man, uh, leave the tip. I'll just take care of it. He goes, oh, man, I ain't bring no cash with me. And I went, all right, then. Well, you take care of the bill and I'll leave the tip. He goes, I ain't bring my credit card with me. I said, hold the fuck up. You called me to go out to breakfast. If I call you to say, let's go out to eat, I'm taking care of it. He called me, drugged me out of my hotel. And I was like, oh, I told him, I said, hold on, hold on. So you asked me to go to breakfast and you ain't got no cash or credit card? How are you paying for it? He goes, no, nah, man. I go, next time, just let me know you want a free meal. I'm cool with that. Just let me know ahead of time, though. I said, because now I'm looking at you all vindictive. Like, it don't, <laughs> but looking back on it, like, now we laugh about it. Here's the thing about my road manager, Brad. He's a great dude. Probably one of the nicest guys you're ever on the planet. But, and he'll tell you this, when he got on the road with me, he got caught up in getting comfortable. It's easy to get comfortable being a stand-up's road manager because you got to realize we go to comedy clubs, you got a waiter, waitress, what do you want to eat? They'll get whatever you want. They'll go out to get you something to eat. If you want Chipotle, they'll go get it. The club will. And you're drinking for free too. You can get caught up in the partying. And socially, you're already tapped in. People want you to come to their nightclubs and everything else. You can get caught up quick in this business. And Brad was getting caught up and not handling this business. So I had to let him go. And when I tell you, Brad is one of the most talented painters I've ever seen. He's painted my house, my cousin's house, numerous. He's in Atlanta. You know, he's a talented dude when it comes to painting houses like that. And I, I can't do stuff like that. And I had told him, I said, dude, you're getting this backwards. You're putting my stand up in front of you painting. I was like, so he wasn't working as much. So money's not coming in. So I had to let him go. Like I said, you got to put your painting job because that's your business. That's your business. You have employees. I said, that comes first. And then when you can go on the road with me, great. But if not, I'll tell you if I really need you on the road for some important gigs. Like this run, I really needed him. I, Chicago, Detroit, and Dallas, I needed him for these four dates. I can't be out here by myself. But a lot of times comedy clubs, they kind of run themselves. And I do have Gene and Say with me. I got my openers. So, but when I let him go like that, and I had to let him go for like six months, seven months. And now he's got it all figured out. He's got money in his pocket. He can take little trips now. He's, he's, you know, he's getting corporate accounts with his painting business. It's flourishing. And he's still able to go on the road with me, but not every week. But when I need him, I'll just let him know ahead of time, I really need you this weekend. He can make arrangements to be on the road with me. So it worked. It's one of, them, it's one of those cool things where I've seen him progress. It's crazy. Like he progressed at the same time I was progressing. Like he's been my road manager since the end of 2008. And when we started, I wasn't making a lot of money and I was, I was doing okay, but not great. And then the movies came out and my specials started coming out and the money went up and I started selling a lot of tickets. And 
So I've taken off and then now Brad's taken off. It's cool because we've like, we've struggled together and now we're both doing well together. So it's cool. It's, it's good to see, man. Um, okay, I got still got to do my crazy stepdad story. With it being Christmas, I've told a Christmas story before where he, he, he smacked me and said I ruined Christmas. Uh, this one, I stopped talking to him for this reason. Uh, 2008, so it was nine years ago, is when I completely, like, completely stopped talking to him because where I'm from, I'm from a small town in Ohio called Oxford. And around every Thanksgiving or Christmas break, they have a thing called Towny Night where all the local townie guys that went to Talawanda and girls, we get together, we'll find a, a bar and everyone from the high school, I'm talking from the graduated 30 years ago to two years ago, we all end up hanging out and catching up. And I found out, I just happened to be in Oxford at my mom and stepdad's house and it was townie night. I go, no way, tonight's townie night? So I said, I'm gonna go see some friends at townie night. And right when I was about to walk out the door, my stepdad said, Hope you don't get your ass kicked. And I just thought it was weird. And he did it like, try to act like he was making a joke. But in my mind, I go, who says that? To somebody that's in a great mood, about to have a good time with their friends. Most dads would be like, hey, have a good time tonight, man, or enjoy yourself. So in my mind, it clicked. He said a lot without saying it, basically. I was like, oh, the only reason you say it to somebody is either you want to see them get their ass kicked or you want to kick their ass. One or the other. And the same night he said that, early in the night, I was made a joke. I was with the family. And he said something. He goes, hey, man, people pay to hear you tell jokes like that? And I went, millions pay. Because <laughs> my thing is, growing up, he always bagged on me because I made fun of me because I wasn't a great athlete. and I wasn't this. I wasn't that. It was always making fun of me. One thing you will not tell me is I'm not funny. I can't believe people pay to see you. I'm like, one thing I know I am, I'm a good stand-up. And I'm a funny dude. I know that. So you are not going to question me on that. So I looked at him. I just went, millions. <laughs> millions pay to see me. And then when he said, when I left out there, I hope you don't get your ass kicked. I go, oh, he wants to kick my ass. Or he wants somebody to really. That was it. That's when I just stopped coming around. I go, okay, I got it. I know what's going on here. Because I have a friend that always says, you can't go around your stepdad, dude. The older he gets, the less he has to lose. And he might Marvin Gaye you, though. So. I left that alone. But uh, I, I, I tell you what, uh, I started the week. I just thought Bengals had packed it in. The season was done. And then they come out and surprise me and beat the crap out of the Lions. I was like, what? Where was this all year? Two things I noticed. Andre Smith, he was out. He was, our, he was one of the tackles. And then Cedric Obwehi was also out. So those were supposed to be our quote-unquote best offensive linemen on the Bengals. They go out. They don't play this week. We have the worst rushing offense in the league. And the start running back, Joe Mixing, goes out after the first. But he had a, he had a great first series. He got dinged up. Giovanni Bernard comes in, rushes for over 100 yards. I'm like, okay. Uh, offensive line was was making huge holes. And what they had was, they moved Eric Winston over to right tackle, moved one of, the, one of the guards over to left tackle, and they brought in two rookies who've basically been on the practice squad and on the bench all year to be the two guards. And it's one thing to be a veteran, guaranteed contract. Season's almost over. You don't want to get hurt. You want to make sure you're playing for next year. I get that. I really do. But you bring in some rookies that are trying, they're, they're trying to show out not for the Bengals, but for other teams too. And them mugs was blocking. Andy Dalton had a lot of time. I was like, okay. <laughs> Uh, and, and I, I hate how people be like, you know, just, um, I can't believe they won. They're ruining their draft position. No, they didn't. Them beating the lions. They went from the ninth pick to the 10th pick. Big deal. <laughs> and plus I hate to quote, hate to quote Herm Edwards, but you play to win the game. You get out there and, and, and I hate fans that do that stuff. Like, I, you know, I root for the Bengals regardless. I don't, you know, I don't care. I don't care if they haven't won yet. I don't care if it ruins their draft position. I still root for them to win. You want to end the season on a good note and in a, in a good mood. Uh, the playoffs that are going to be the funnest is in the NFC. I don't know if that's a word. I might have just made that up. I don't know. The bestest, funnest, the goodest, I don't care. I'm looking forward to the NFC playoffs more than the AFC the first weekend because I do think there's a, there's a drop-off. I think 
Pittsburgh and, and New England has has shown they're the by far the top two teams in the AFC all year. But then you got Kansas City, who's dropped off tremendously. Um, nobody's thinking Buffalo's a Super Bowl contender at all. And I don't think a lot of people think of Baltimore's a Super Bowl contender at all. And then I I just I tell you, Robert Kraft had to come to Bill Belichick and say, we're not getting rid of Brady. Because if you look at all the veteran quarterbacks, the great ones, they all go to another team eventually. Uh, unless you're like Elway, who got out after a Super Bowl victory. Um, Marino, even he overstayed his welcome in Miami, and look what that did. I think it set the franchise back a few years. That They've never really fully recovered. But the good teams... They know when it's time to let go of a quarterback. Joe Montana, 49ers. They had a good backup, Steve Young. They say, like, okay, we got we got to move on. And Montana goes to Kansas City. It happens. You got Peyton Manning. Indy knew, look, it's time to move on from Peyton. So they move on and, and they got it, they end up drafting Andrew Luck. So I, my personal opinion, and I, I have no basis to say where it came from is I think Robert Kraft literally told Belichick we're not getting rid of Brady because Kraft is quick to say I view Tom Brady as like a son a son that I never had and they're gonna just gonna ride Brady to the wheels fall off and you even now you see he's over 40 and once once it got the week 12 13 14 15 it's getting cold your body doesn't recover as much. You don't have as much zip on the ball. Uh, Brady's just been okay. I mean, he, you know, he, he did what he had to do against Pittsburgh, and it helps that you do have the best tight end in the NFL. But he still he needs that bye week more than anybody. And uh, you know, age is, is catching up with him. You can tell later on the season. I think early in the season it, it doesn't. You know, and it, and and one thing about Brady, I'll give him this: he he, he keeps himself in such good shape. And it always reminds me of what Jason Kidd said when he played for the Mavericks. And somebody asked him, like, Jason, you've been in the league so long. You know, you're, you're almost 40. Uh, how are you still able to play at a high level? And he goes, it's not the games that age you. It's what you do in between the games. So going out, partying, all the other stuff. You know, and take it back to another sport, but Mayweather's like that. Like Mayweather gives you the illusion he's out partying and everything, but he's not. He doesn't drink. He doesn't do any drugs. So basically, he might be at a nightclub, but he's just awake. <laughs> and he's known, Mayweather was known to leave a nightclub and go work out after he left the nightclub because he didn't drink and party. And that's the biggest difference between him and Adrian Broner. Broner wants to be Mayweather so bad, but when Broner goes out, he parties for real. And all that partying catches up with you it eventually, especially in a sport like boxing. That's brutal. But Brady keeps himself in tip-top shape, so it reminds me of what Jason Kidd said about what happens in between the game is what makes you older. But 40 is 40 in a sport like football. So I don't know what's going to happen in the playoffs. I, 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 man. Because if you look at it, it seems like every team has another team's number. They they have like the kryptonite in the playoffs, and <laughs> but but that's the AFC because you have all these traditional powers still in the playoffs. New England, Pittsburgh. Look at Kansas City since Andy Reid's been there. You know AFC's you know it's gonna be okay, but it, you you everybody it's all the matchups over there for the NFC, man. Because you gotta realize all the. The great, we say great quarterbacks are the lower seeds. If you look at the top three teams. It's Nick Foles, Case Keenum, Jared Goff. I, I, you know, I, I might, do, I'm gonna do my Super Bowl, Super Bowl picks early. I just think Minnesota's gonna do it for some reason. I, I just think they're gonna be that first team to host the Super Bowl, and they're gonna be in it. And 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 in the AFC, I'm I'm gonna stick with New England. Even though I just I just did a ten minute rant on Brady getting old, but I still think it's going. To, so right now, New England and Minnesota going in the playoffs. It almost is like next year. Obviously, the Rams are going to be the favorite in the NFC West, but San Francisco guarantee you when the prognostications and the predictions come out and they start coming out like in 
April, May, after the draft, around the draft, I guarantee you everyone will have San Francisco in the playoffs. Guarantee you. And because of one person, Jimmy Garoppolo. And you cannot tell me, Bill Belichick is so smart and such a good coach. You cannot tell me he don't want to take one run without Brady. And if he knew he had Garoppolo and he knew what (laughs) Garoppolo was capable of that everyone's finding out now, you can't tell me he didn't look at Robert Kraft like, you son of a bitch. (laughs) You are not going to let me get rid of Brady? Come on, man. So San Francisco is going to be fun to watch next year. Um, And the other big news this week was James Harrison left the Steelers. They released him, and there wasn't a doubt where he was going. And I don't – I kind of see both sides of it. Like now there's everybody in Pittsburgh is like, he's a traitor. He left us. And then James released a statement saying, you know, I wouldn't have signed with Pittsburgh if I known I was going to be sitting on the bench. I signed because I want to play it. He goes, I don't want to sit on the bench and just collect a paycheck. He goes, <clears throat> and for all those people saying I, you know, wasn't a good teammate, he goes, ask TJ Watt if I didn't help him. Ask these other guys if I didn't help him. Ask Ryan Shazier if I didn't go visit him in the hospital and I didn't go help him. Come on now. He ain't been at a, deep down, he wanted to be a Steeler, but be nothing more than he wouldn't like better than to play them in the playoffs and beat their ass. And this whole hurt your legacy? No, it don't. You know what hurt your legacy? OJ Simpson hurt his legacy. Uh, When you switch football teams, it is what it is. You can't be mad at somebody because they want to play. And they're, they, they feel in their heart that they still can play. Because I, I guess James Harrison posted a video of him in the weight room like, you got all this on the bitch. So he kind of forced the hand. He wanted to be released because he wants to play. I'm not mad at anybody like that. You know, it, it's not like it's some rookie. It's not like, I don't know if you guys remember Freddie Mitchell, who was like the third receiver in Philly when Tara Owens was there. He would make crazy demands, but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't produce enough to make demands like that. Whereas uh, Harrison has produced, I mean, still best defensive play I've ever seen in the Super Bowl was that last play before halftime against the Cardinals when he intercepted Kurt Warner and ran all the way back for a touchdown. Oh, that was crazy. And I'll tell you a funny story about that Super Bowl. So I was at the Tampa Improv when the Steelers were playing the Cardinals. In that Super Bowl. And the, the, obviously the game was in Tampa. <clears throat> I was there. I got there Thursday. And I literally saw less than 50 Cardinal fans in Tampa. It was all Steeler fans everywhere. So one night after my shows, we would hit up all these different Super Bowl parties. So we got invited to uh, Floyd Mayweather had rented out a mansion. And he had a mansion party. He had Keisha Cole perform. Hey, Keisha Cole and Robin Thicke was the two performers. And we got there late. We got there after the concert. And the, and the mansion had this big backyard. So we're in there and we're partying. And here's what's funny about the party. We get there and I got like six people with me. And the dude at the door was like, yeah, it's 500 a piece. And I was like, I'm not about to pay $3,000 to get into this party. That, by the way, I was invited to. And... I see it's not crowded. So I'm texting a friend of mine who's inside the party. I said, is it jumping? He goes, not at all. (laughs) But it is open bar. So I'm like, dude, we're not paying. I'm not paying $500 a person. So literally this guy and like two other people got in a huddle and they come back and was like, all right, Gary, you can get in free. The other five got to pay. I was like, no, I'm not paying $2,500 to go into the party. I'm not lying. They huddled up again. Came back. All right. How about 500 for all of you? <laughs> I was like, no. When I tell you they huddled up again and said, what can you give us? <laughs> so it went from 3000 to what can you give us? So I literally pulled out a $100 bill. And one of the people with me was Haywood Workman who used to play for the Pacers and is now an NBA referee, he pulled out $100 and we gave him 200 And we just almost did it to save faith. So we paid about $32 a person. But we got in, everybody drank for free, we had a good time. Now here's the 
here's the crazy part about the party. We're sitting there, and the way it was set up, there was tables, and it was almost like a ballroom setting where the the big um, the big dance floor where the concert was and everything. It was like an outside inside deal, and me and my road manager Brad are sitting there, and I see Brad like look down at the ground. Then I look down, and I'm, Brad must have saw what I saw two seconds before I saw it. And I looked down, and it was two Super Bowl tickets on the floor underneath this table. And Brad leaned down to pick it up, and he saw it a split second before I did. And he came over to me, he goes, are these? And I looked at him, I said, I think they are. So what we did, we went to the men's bathroom and locked ourselves in a stall to see if these are really Super Bowl tickets. So I told Brad, I go, everyone thinks we're gay or doing cocaine right now. Because <laughs> you got two grown men in a stall. <laughs> and we're looking at them like, oh, shit, these are Super Bowl tickets. They are. So the face value was $650 on this ticket. I don't know. I can't remember where it was, where it was at in the stadium. So it's, it's $1,300 at face value. So this is what I told Brad. I said, what do we do? I said, we're not going to tell anybody we found two Super Bowl tickets. Because then if, if the DJ or somebody says it over the sound system, people can lie and be like, they're mine. So what we did, it was like, we're just going to hold them. And we never left that party till it closed. It's, well, let's say it stayed up until 3 in the morning. We never left it. Nobody ever said they were missing Super Bowl tickets. And we stayed. Brad had a blazer on. He put them in the inside of his blazer. And he just kept them there. So the next day, this is Friday, Friday night, we found the tickets. This was like before, you know, um, I'm sure StubHub was around and I'm sure all these other websites was around that you could sell stuff, but it wasn't prevalent like that then. So this, this is eight, nine years ago. Uh, or, or we just were stupid. We didn't know how to do it, how to sell the tickets. So Brad said he wanted to sell them. He needed the money. I said, cool. I said, well, I, how about we just get up early Sunday morning head down to the stadium and scalp them. And he's all right. Well, within the people I was with that week, a lot of them were Steeler fans. And I was with a couple of guys that were Steeler fans that were from Pittsburgh, but they had friends of friends that were in town. So one guy knew another guy and him and his girl are huge Steeler fans. And they came down there to scalp tickets. So they asked Brad, he said, dude, I'll give you a thousand dollars right now for him. So the guy had the cash and Brad took the quick money. And I don't find this out till later. And I said, you dumbass. I said, did you negotiate? He goes, no, nah, I just, I go, oh, I just shook my head. I go, did they just ripped you off? I was like, you could have got, and, and Steeler fans were everywhere. Could have got four or $5,000. He got $1,000. That guy got less than face value. I said, bro, you didn't sell for face value. You could have just said, yo, man, that's the face value, 1300 I wouldn't even been mad at him for that. But I was like, dude. I was so disappointed, but he was just like, man, I need the money, man. I, oh, oh my God. And, and then what made it worse, it was a great Super Bowl, One of the best ever. And I was just looking at him like, dude, you just made that guy's year. Him and his girlfriend <laughs> went to the Super Bowl for a thousand bucks. But you can look at it two ways. He was a thousand dollars to the good for going to the party, but man. Lost those Super Bowl tickets. Ah, I was like, oh, Brad. Uh, <laughs> so, so anyways, man. All right, y'all. Well, I hope everybody has a great 2018. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast.